between 1985 and 1988, 18 Francians, hitchhikers, and prostitutes were choked, sexually molested, and left for dead in the desert mountains of California. The only witnesses, the insects of the desert. And they also turned out to be extremely important pieces of evidence. and sexually molested were all dumped and left for dead in the high desert mountains near San Diego, California. Not all of the victims died, and those who survived all described the same scenario. Several of them had their pants undone and pulled down. Uh, bras were moved up, exposing their breasts. Uh, one lady had a nipple ring removed. We thought there would been there had been some sort of sexual activity, but because they were unconscious, we had no proof of it. Betty Bass was one of the victims. I see you do love. Bye bye. She's had a history of mental problems and is currently homeless. But she can vividly recall the night eight years ago when she accepted a ride from a stranger. After leaving this motel on El Cajon Boulevard, she looked for a ride going towards Ramona, California. A man in a silver car pulled up and offered to take her part way. I can take you as far as El Centro. Good enough. He had a clean car, so I thought, you know, that's a pretty good guy. Pretty nice guy, you know. I just thought he was okay. As they drove over the mountains, the driver said he needed to pull off the highway to take a bathroom break. When the driver walked around the car, he asked Betty to grab something from the back seat. As she did, he wrapped his arm around her neck and choked her. The last thing she remembers was losing consciousness. When she woke up, she walked up this hill looking for help. So I walked and I walked and I walked. Well, I finally um, crawled over this fence. I crawled to the other side of the street. Some family came by and put me in their uh, motorhome and uh, ate me up a little bit. And then they took me to the hospital. The scene of the attack is right here in the dirt, right by this little knoll. The car tire tracks stopped back here a few feet. 
And then you could see footprints up into this area. Her clothing, some of her clothing was found here. Police photographed the shoe and tire prints and also recovered two Marlboro cigarette butts. On Betty Bass's shirt, detectives noticed a tiny red carpet fiber. This attack sounded identical to another in the same vicinity just one month earlier. Two young girls were hitchhiking together at a restaurant near the interstate highway. A silver compact automobile pulled up and the middle-aged man offered them a ride. Where are you girls gone? We're heading to Tucson. Take you as far as El Centro. Okay. Hop in. It was a ride they'll never forget. This girl was fortunate. She survived her attack, and her friend, whom she feared was dead, was later found in the desert, frightened but alive. The victims all provided a similar description of their attacker. He was about early 40s, short hair, blondish grayish color, glasses. That's how they all described him. Obviously, these were people who were going to take rides from anyone. But they, many of them told us that they felt comfortable getting in the car with him. And there were other similarities with all of these attacks. The things he said to these women, it was almost uh, like he had a script. It was almost the same type of scenario. I can only take you 40 miles. I'm only going to El Centro. The type of people he was victimizing were the vulnerable people in society. Some people who were having mental problems, uh, drug addicts street people, hitchhikers. Police had a description of the suspect, some tire tracks, and shoe print evidence, but little else. A sexual predator was loose in the mountains of California. San Diego's El Cajon Boulevard, where prostitutes, runaways, and transients have congregated for years. The reason? Location. It's close to a highway entrance ramp, convenient for hitchhikers looking for a ride. here where many of the victims were picked up. We had a series of live victims and we also had uh, dead victims out there who we thought were part of the pattern. Uh, we had what we thought was a pretty consistent pattern, a common 
footprints, common tire tracks, same type of victims being victimized, and certainly the same area where they're being picked up and dumped. <laughs> Journalists Jay Stryker Meyer and Frank Klemko covered these crimes for the local newspaper. There was terror on the streets. Uh, women were terrified. People were very scared. The deputy or some would find a body. They'd go out to say, yep, oh, it's a dead body. Then they'd come out and say, well, who is it? So not only could they not investigate it as to who killed this person, but they had to establish the identity of the victim. In some cases, they never did. When detectives were called to Sheep's Head Mountain on July 21st, 1988, they feared another in the series of choke and dump cases. This time, the victim was dead and nude from the waist down. She was found laying on the road here. This was more dug out at the time. The, the graders come in here every so often, and she was in the more in the ditch type of thing. The victim had been dead for quite some time. Her skin was brown and blistered from the sun. Her legs and feet were covered with blood. It appeared the victim was alive before falling into the ditch because impressions of her arms flailing were found in the dirt. Detectives noticed a blood trail and her bare foot Prince leading almost a mile up the mountain. At the top of the mountain, detectives found a pair of shoes, some clothing, two sets of footprints, and signs of a struggle. The footprints led detectives to a parking area where they noticed a tire track. It looked as if a car had turned around before leaving the scene. The victim's bare footprints led from the clearing into the brush. Somehow, she gets herself out of this area and then comes back up and then finds her way down the main road. On the body, investigators discovered some tiny clues. Hundreds of live, worm-like creatures. They were carefully collected and preserved, then taken to the forensics lab for analysis. Was it possible these tiny insects could tell forensic scientists something about the victim's last moments alive or even when she was killed. The autopsy revealed that the victim had probably been choked, but strangulation wasn't the cause of death. The the cause of death was actually a laceration of the vagina. Uh, the mechanism would have been blood loss from that laceration. The victim was identified as Sandra Swick, a 43-year-old transient from Florida. Swick's body was found in the same general vicinity as many of the other choke and dump victims. All were found the same distance from the interstate highway, usually near a V in the road where the attacker could park 
without being seen by others. Detectives still didn't have a suspect. But three months after Swick's murder, detectives got an unexpected break. While patrolling in the mountains, Sheriff's deputy Larry Daly noticed a car driving out of a deserted side road. And as I came around the bend here, I could see the, the car coming out. Daly turned onto the side road and saw a woman lying in the dirt, unconscious but still alive. I saw the victim uh, laying on the ground, pants down past her knees, her shirt uh, pulled up to her neck as if someone had choked her. Daly immediately called for an ambulance and put out a description of the car he saw driving from the scene. After three years of frustration, could this be the break investigators were hoping for? After finding the body of an unconscious woman in the desert, Sheriff's Deputy Larry Daly rushed to his vehicle and called for help. I also called out the description of the vehicle that I saw uh, coming down the road towards me. A short time later, this silver Honda was stopped by an officer who heard the call. What I wanted to see was I wanted to see a monster. I wanted to see this monstrous man, maybe someone with three arms, who came out and was abducting women and, and, and strangling them. The driver was 41-year-old Ronald Porter, an automotive mechanic with a history of sexual offenses. The woman found unconscious in the desert survived her attack and was able to identify Porter as her attacker. Porter confessed to the attack, but would not admit to any of the other attacks over the past three years. Investigators believe Porter was responsible, and they also suspected that Porter had murdered Sandra Swick three months earlier. To find out if all these crimes were the work of one individual, San Diego authorities sought help from the FBI and their unit, which specializes in studying serial murderers. That another offender would choose to abduct the same type of victim, bring it to the same type of location, do the same types of acts with them in the same locations, the almost exact locations became pretty, pretty evident to us that the probabilities favored it being one person. Larry Ankrum identified the remote desert dump sites as the signature element of all of the crimes. The attacker invested lots of time and effort into finding these remote locations. Another signature element was the type of women he chose. He's making an assessment before he decides he's going to go ahead and ask her if she needs a ride. And, and when he's made that initial impression, then once he's decided, yeah, I can control this victim, um, then she gets in the car, and then it becomes somewhat of a game with him to get her where he wants, wants to go. The FBI was convinced that all of these crimes were indeed 
the work of the same individual. The next step was for San Diego authorities to prove that Ronald Porter committed these crimes. Now you have to go back to your forensics, uh, you know, your crime scenes, and you have him, you have his clothing, you have his shoes, you have his car. Now you're going to go out and get search warrants for his apartment or his house or his storage sheds, which we did. The carpet fibers in Porter's car were microscopically similar to the red carpet fiber found on the blouse of Betty Bass. Tire tracks found at some of the crime scenes were similar to the print on the spare Michelin tire found in the trunk of Porter's car. And when searching Porter's apartment, police found shoes and boots with tread marks consistent with those found at some of the choke and dump crime scenes. A walkie-talkie discovered in Porter's storage shed belonged to a woman who was choked and dumped in the desert mountains a few years earlier. And the blouse worn by that same victim contained a semen stain. A DNA analysis of Ronald Porter's blood matched the semen stain from the blouse. But despite all of this evidence, prosecutors faced a major legal problem. By the time police arrested Ronald Porter, the statute of limitations on most of these assault cases had run out. If prosecutors were going to send Porter to jail for any length of time, it would have to be for the murder of Sandra Swick. But the Swick murder was their weakest case. Investigators found no semen, no blood, no hair or clothing fibers which could link Ronald Porter to the Swick crime scene. A tire track found at the Sandra Swick attack site was too faint for analysis. However, some of the tennis shoe prints found at the Swick crime scene were similar to a pair of tennis shoes found in Ronald Porter's apartment. But Porter's attorney says a similar tennis shoe print is inconclusive. But five million other people with similar shoes, with similar tread, could also have made the print. And the prosecution faced another problem. They weren't exactly sure when Sandra Swick was murdered. Time of death determination by a pathologist is a very inexact science, if it's a science at all. Um, there are certain changes the body undergoes, and we can predict general time frames for those, but there's a lot of different variables that uh, affect it. If prosecutors wanted to convict Ronald Porter of murder, they needed more. Could the tiny insects found on Swick's body tell forensic scientists when Sandra Swick died and tie Ronald Porter to her murder? When detectives found Sandra Swick's body on Sheepshead Mountain, it was badly decomposed. The hot desert air and sun had taken its toll, and hundreds of tiny worm-like creatures 
were feeding on her decomposing flesh. Investigators wondered if these tiny creatures might offer some clues about when Sandra Swick died. Detectives collected about a hundred of these creatures and sent them to the laboratory of David Faulkner. He's a forensic entomologist, an expert on insect activity on dead bodies. They can tell you lots about where they've been, where the victim's been, uh, how old the victim is, conditions of the body following death. And those are the things that are interesting. Faulkner's first task was to determine the age of these creatures, or maggots as they're called, so he preserved some in alcohol at the exact stage of development as when they were found. Eventually, the maggots would shrink and develop a hard shell, and a week later, emerge as a winged adult. Once Faulkner had an adult, he could compare it to the hundreds of different flies which inhabit the California desert where Swick's body was found. After hours of study and analysis, Faulkner identified them. The flies were sarcophaga, also known as flesh flies. And the reason why they're called flesh flies is because they lay their young live on rotting flesh of animals or people. Uh, and then the maggots then proceed to feed on the bodies of this rotting flesh until such time as they pupate and then become adults. Other things this particular group of flies uh, will do is they'll fly in very bad weather. So if it's foggy or rainy or overcast, they'll be active and they'll be searching out a potential host. Uh, whereas other flies will probably settle and wait until the sun comes out or till it gets warmer. Once Faulkner knew they were sarcophaga, he could study the exact time frame of their life cycle. The preserved specimens were in their third or final stage of larval development. Once you have them identified, you know what stage in development the most developed ones are, then you go backwards and say, okay, this was the temperature regime at that time. This is how long this particular insect takes to develop to this stage. Therefore, that body was available to these insects for this amount of time. Usually, that indicates how long the person's been dead. In normal weather conditions, it takes a week for the baby maggots to develop to their third stage. But the weather conditions in the desert are far from normal. During the week Sandra Swick's body was discovered, the daytime temperatures averaged 92 degrees. In 92 degree weather, it would take only three and a half days for the freshly laid maggots to develop to their third and final stage. And Faulkner was able to tell investigators something else. The sarcophaga never deposit their maggots in the dark. 
They only do so in daylight. I'm going to This meant that Sandra Swick was still alive when the sun set on Sunday evening, July 17th. But she was dead by daybreak on Monday morning, July 18th. At the first sign of light, these flesh flies were attracted to the chemical scent of Swick's decomposing flesh and immediately laid their maggots. The maggots would not have been as developed if she had been alive longer. If she had been alive Monday afternoon, uh, Monday evening, there's no way that these flies under those temperature conditions could have developed to that stage. Faulkner's conclusions provided police with the scientific time frame for Swick's murder. Now, detectives could investigate Ronald Porter's whereabouts during the time of Swick's death. Porter worked as a mechanic at this automotive chain store. When his time sheets were subpoenaed, they revealed he was not at work on Sunday, July 17th. In addition, Porter provided no alibi regarding his whereabouts on that day. And it matched up. Uh, we had a time period where Ron Porter was available to drive from uh, north part of the county uh, down to pick up Sandra Swick and transport her to East, East County. Based on the insect clues and the similarities between the Swick murder and the other cases, Ronald Porter was charged in the murder of Sandra Swick. Prosecutors believe Ronald Porter picked up Swick as she hitchhiked somewhere near an entrance ramp to Interstate 8. I'm going to Florida. Jump in. I can take you about 40 miles to El Centro. That'd be great. Good. As the car traveled east into the mountains, Porter pulled off the main highway onto a dark, deserted road. He may have used some excuse, as he did in other cases, possibly the need to take a bathroom break. As he walked around the back of the car, he surprised Swick from behind. Grabbing her around the neck in a military-type chokehold, he pulled her from the car and choked her until she was unconscious. He threw her to the ground removed her clothes, and sexually assaulted her with his hand. car and fled. Sometime later, Swick regained consciousness. Dizzy, disoriented, and bleeding heavily from the attack, Swick walked barefoot down the dark, deserted road, walking almost a mile before collapsing. 
The blood trail was almost one mile long. And she bled to death from lacerations suffered during the assault. Her death had to be a tough one. Very difficult, long uh, dying process that she went through. And the insect clues were able to provide detectives with the time of death, something they were unable to determine by any other means. My defendant, Ronald Elliot Porter, guilty of the crime of murder. Ronald Porter was convicted of second degree murder in the death of Sandra Swick and was sentenced to 28 years to life in prison. Ronald Porter continues to maintain his innocence. The insect clues were an important element in their case against Ronald Porter. And they told David Faulkner all he needed to know about Sandra Swick's brutal attack and murder. You get a lot of information from them, whether a body's been moved, uh, how long the person's been dead, or how long the body has been available to insects, uh, whether the body's been buried, whether the person took drugs, whether they had been poisoned, all these different sorts of things uh, uh, could be um, uh, in the insects that are collected or removed from the body.